It is indeed, Walter. This is the seven, and this is the six, and as you said, the seven is about 50 miles ahead of and about 17 miles above the six, and Wally Shira in the six is saying, where are you? And the transponder in the seven is saying back to him, here I am, and they're closing, one on the other. But the extraordinary thing about rendezvous radar, this beam that goes from one to the other is then fed automatically into this IBM computer. Actually, it's fed into two instruments aboard the Gemini 6. One of them, this IBM computer. Now, let's say that Wally Shira wants to know just exactly where he is right now. He addresses his computer with six, nine. And all he has to do to find out exactly where he is, in mileage, that is, is to press this readout button. And it shows him at 48.21 miles away from the Gemini 7. He clears his board now, and he wants to know how many feet per second, how much thrust he is going to need to complete or to come very close on this terminal maneuver. So he addresses his computer once again, this time 7, 0. His readout button, and he finds that he's going to need 65.2 feet per second. That's how much thrust he's going to need to get through with this maneuver. What is his orbital angle from Gemini 6 to Gemini 7? He clears his board, addresses 8, 3 in his computer. He reads it out, and this he would find to be a little bit wrong, or I addressed it wrong. Let me clear the board once again. He addresses 8, 3, reads it out, and the computer has momentarily gone down. What it's supposed to show is 130 degrees orbital angle. We'll clear it. There's another instrument, though, that's equally interesting. When he, let's say, has gotten to uh, maybe 10,000 feet away, Walter, he then will turn off his computer, chances are. He's now at 10,000 feet away. Let's take a look at this one. This is known as the range rate indicator, and this one shows how far away in thousands of feet, 10,000 feet. This one shows how many feet per second. What is the velocity? What is the rate at which the Gemini 6 and Gemini 7 are approaching each other? 10,000 feet, and they're approaching each other at about 75 feet per second. What's important is here that as he comes closer, now let's say he's only five feet away, he wants to keep this needle very close to this needle because he doesn't want to collide, he doesn't want to go past. As he comes down to only 100 feet away, he doesn't want very much in the way of feet per second, so let's say that he has seven or eight feet per second here on this rate range indicator. This means that he's going to be approaching very delicately, and as he comes down to this eyeball to eyeball situation, he's barely going to be moving. This adds up the relative velocity of the two spacecraft. Walter, you know that Stan Friedman, who is the father of rendezvous radar, the uh, operation that is so crucial this afternoon has been here with us at our CBS News Space Center now three or four times, and on each occasion, Stan, I wonder if you'd come in. On each occasion, for one reason or another, either the Agena blew up or the GT6 didn't get off the pad, but finally this man is going to have an opportunity to see if rendezvous radar works, and it certainly has been working remarkably up to now. Well, Mike, I would say that, uh, I would say that having him around has been uh, certainly worth it uh, in many ways, and particularly see that big smile on his face when they got the word that the transponder had locked on, the radar had been, assist, uh, contact had been established. Stan, how long had you been working with this rendezvous radar in order to develop it to this fine, fine point? Well, Westinghouse started uh, about three years ago, in 1962, with a group of uh, five or six fellows that uh, started to uh, develop the system. And, of course, that grew, and uh, before it was uh, all over, we had uh, hundreds of people working on it. And if I'm happy, I'm happy for them. How expensive uh, an operation has this been, from development right through to today? Well, the entire program is uh, somewhere in excess of uh, $17 million. And if this sounds like a lot, I hasten to add that uh, it's for uh, all of the sets that were used, some 16 uh, radars and transponders, uh, plus a lot of the cost is in the engineering that went to develop and uh, in the testing. It was tested for all of the, for simulated environments. Of course, this great. rendezvous radar will be vital in the Apollo program in getting the LEM back up to the mothership in order to get 
our astronauts back on Earth. Yes, rendezvous will be uh, very important because, the, as you said, the astronauts on the surface of the moon uh, will have to rendezvous with a vehicle going around the moon in order to make it back to Earth safely. And rendezvous radar is going to let them find their way. We sure hope so. Congratulations to you. It certainly seems to be working perfectly up to now. Thank you, Mike. Walter? Yes, we haven't mentioned for quite a while today the importance of uh, this space first that we are about to report. Uh, we assume we're going to be reporting uh, the fact that Gemini 6 and Gemini 7 have rendezvoused, have come within a thousand feet uh, at least of each other, probably a great deal closer. The first time that has ever happened, uh, that two uh, space vehicles have uh, been brought that close together and under the perfect control that that will require and all the computations that stands uh, radar over there and the IBM computers can uh, feed to the uh, operation. But uh, the importance of this uh, rendezvous is not to be overlooked. Our entire space program uh, for the future, the manned space program, uh, it depends. The whole moon exploration upon rendezvous being proved out as a feasible means uh, to operate in space. We believe also that the Russians depend upon rendezvous, and they are behind us on that. They have not uh, yet attempted rendezvous in space, except by two ballistic uh, spacecraft. And actually, these are capsules. Apparently, they cannot be maneuvered in space, uh, but they have put them rather close, within three miles of each other, simply by orbiting them at that uh, precise point in space. However, they could not, as I say, maneuver toward each other. If we can prove this out for ourselves and the Russians, both space programs can move ahead uh, because we believe that the space, uh, that the uh, Soviet uh, moon program involves the building of a huge uh, space station of some sort uh, out in space, which requires rendezvous, and then the launch from that, uh, perhaps building a, a big rocket itself that would itself then go on to the moon. At any rate, rendezvous apparently is part of their consideration as well. At rendezvous, um, final phase maneuver should, uh, the terminal maneuver should begin in another uh, minute or two from now. We expect to be hearing from it just as soon as uh, Manned Space Center in Houston gets word. Meanwhile, out at St. Louis, in that uh, remarkably lifelike and life-size Gemini spacecraft we have out there, Bill Stout and Bob Sharp, McDonnell Aircraft, can show us uh, just about what's going to be happening in this rendezvous. Bill? Well, Walter, I think Bob can pick it up with the radar once they've locked on as they did quite a while ago. Bob, what do you see if you're Wally Shira to show that you're locked on to the radar Mr. Friedman is so pleased about? Well, as soon as the uh, radar is turned on and locked on, you'll see a uh, green light on the uh, front panel, which uh, indicates that you're uh, locked on. And over just to the uh, left of that, on the attitude ball, when he selects uh, radar on his flight director needles and he's pointed toward the target, then these two needles that we see here will be crossed, uh, indicating, and this indicates then the direction of which the target is uh, from the spacecraft. Just a little bit below that, we have a range and range rate indicator, which uh, Mike Wallace uh, gave us a pretty good demonstration on a while ago, which will tell uh, how far you are from the uh, uh, target and what uh, rate that you're closing on it kind of a speedometer in reverse. Uh, that's essentially what it is, just a speedometer. The really exciting part, though, has to be when they're within sight of each other, when visually they make contact, which should be at any moment, I suppose, if, if indeed it hasn't already happened. Uh, yes, of course, this is a, a variable uh, uh, distance, depending on uh, uh, how good a guy's eye, eyes are, how well he's dark adapted, and so on. But they'll use this optical sight uh, place it in the window, uh, and then uh, through it, we'll see essentially a picture like a gun sight. Uh, you'll see the flashing light on Spacecraft 7 in this. Now, right now, are they on the dark side of the Earth? Uh, yes, they plan to conduct the whole rendezvous on the dark side of the Earth and uh, just come out on the uh, daylight side at the uh, final phase or just about at docking. So this is the kind of thing they'll have to fly by? Uh, yes, all up until they uh, get fairly close, 500 and maybe 1,000 feet, and then they'll turn those flashing lights off because they're just simply too bright for a uh, real close approach. And uh, turn on the docking light, which is uh, on top of each spacecraft, and this is about as bright, or a third as bright as an automobile headlight, uh, which will give a uh, good illumination to the spacecraft then as they approach at close range at night. 
And of course, Walter, this takes us back, and your talk about the next step in our space program brings it to mind. This takes us back to one of the strong points the people here at McDonald, the astronauts, the men in Houston and the Cape have talked about with such enthusiasm in reference to Gemini. It is built to be flown by the men inside, as Wally Shira is about to demonstrate up there. Uh, yes, but uh, we have uh, the uh, IBM computer and the uh, radar, all this stuff providing information that they can use in this process. And that's what they're doing right now, flying. Walter? We're listening to uh, Gemini Control in Houston. Uh, let's uh, see if we can pick that up. should be down on the order of 30 miles. We have had no uh, conversation via Tanana Reeve at this point. And as Chris Kraft observed earlier, the ground has done all it can at this point through computations. It's all up to them now. We're standing by. We'll come back to you when we have additional information. This is Gemini Control, Houston. That report from Paul Haney was that uh, they had garbled transmission from the Rose Knot Victor. That's the tracking station out in the South Atlantic. Uh, garbled transmission, but they believe they understood Tom Stafford to say that he had visual contact uh, with the, the Gemini 7, that he could see the flashing lights, the powerful acquisition lights on the top of the Gemini 7. Uh, that's what they thought they understood uh, from a garbled transmission to the Rose Knot Victor line there in the South Atlantic. They're on their way now toward contact with the Tanana Reef Station, and they may learn more later. However, they did get confirmation that the terminal maneuver had begun as planned about now, four minutes ago. That means that Shira is now on a line of sight basis uh, as computed by his radar, beginning to uh, give the, uh, the spacecraft the boost it needs to begin to close up that 17 miles that they're now below and some 39 miles, 38 miles they are behind Gemini 7. And this maneuver, which takes about 30 minutes, they will uh, slowly close and uh, come up under and in front of the uh, Gemini 7. Uh, they presumably have communication with each other. Uh, they would normally do that through the ground. When they're out of touch of ground stations, they can get in touch uh, one with the other uh, by going to their so-called UHF channels. This can be or cannot be done as they choose at the moment. All seems to be going exceedingly well. Everything has been precisely on the schedule plan. The only unplanned uh, maneuver of the day uh, was one that actually was uh, in their contingency thinking all along. They didn't quite get to the altitude they wanted in their first altitude change on the first orbit with Gemini 6. On the second time around, they gave it just a little, they called it to themselves a tweak. Uh, less than a second of uh, burst of the rockets just to bring up the level a little tiny bit. That's all that's been necessary. Everything else has been precisely on schedule. And now these two spacecraft on their 165th revolution, uh, entering its uh, well, half hour away from entering its 12th day of Gemini 7, and the uh, fourth revolution of Gemini 6. The altitude they wanted in their first altitude change on the first orbit with Gemini 6, on the second time around, they gave it just a little, they called it to themselves a tweak. Uh, less than a second of uh, burst of the rockets just to bring up the level a little tiny bit. That's all that's been necessary. Everything else has been precisely on schedule. And now these two spacecraft on their 165th a revolution uh, entering its uh, well, half hour away from entering its 12th day of Gemini 7 and the uh, fourth revolution of Gemini 6. The rendezvous mission, uh, the rendezvous phase of the rendezvous mission is on. It began five minutes ago and uh, we will be uh, staying right here with it, uh, waiting for reports from Houston Manned Space Center and, uh, from, uh, uh, and from the astronauts themselves as relayed through the tracking stations and through Houston. They have not uh, specified as to when they expect to get another transmission, but looking at our Colesman orbital map, we see that they are even now in contact with the Tanana Reeve station, or should be if radio communication is as good as it has been all day. And uh, very shortly, they will be passing out of touch with that station out over the, uh, the Indian Ocean on the way to the next contact at Carnarvon, Australia, on the western coast of Australia. 
So uh, even now, down in Houston, uh, we assume that uh, the Space Center is talking but through a relay with Tanana Reeve to uh, the Gemini 7 and 6 spacecraft. And if that uh, garbled uh, transmission from Rose, not Victor, uh, is confirmed, they're probably hearing that the spacecraft uh, astronauts Borman and Lovell in 7 and uh, Shira and Stafford in 6 are talking to one another. We may, uh, and seeing each other, which is even more important. We may get a report uh, on that very shortly from Houston. Uh, we're hoping that we do and waiting for Paul Haney to confirm it for us.